we've been in a series of messages on conversations with Jesus, different encounters that he's had, and uh, uh, looking to see what we can apply in our lives. And today, uh, the conversation we're going to look at, I realized I have never preached on in my entire life. I have avoided this uh, <laughs> unconsciously, I think. Um, I actually went back through a lot of my files to see uh, what I'd said about this passage in the past. Nothing. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Like, so this may be a very personal sermon today. Um, it's in Luke chapter 8. And uh, it's an interesting part of the, uh, uh, the narrative about Jesus because in the middle of chapter 8, there's a very uh, familiar passage where the Jesus and the disciples are out on a boat and a storm comes up and they're all afraid and Jesus is taking a nap in the boat and they wake him up and they say, this is horrible, this storm's going to kill us all. And, uh, and Jesus said, what's, it, what's your problem? You know, why are you afraid? And, and then he calms the storm and then it says, and then they were really afraid. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting, you know, when, when Jesus works and he does what we ask him to do, then we're really afraid because now what's this going to mean to us? That is immediately followed by the passage we're going to look at today that is another storm that Je Jesus calms of a different kind. And the responses are very similar. So beginning in verse 26, they sailed after that storm. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? Legion, he replied, because many, many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. And a large herd of pigs, which Mark tells us was like 2,000 pigs, that's a that's a major herd, and probably a major mess um, for the guy to be living there. Um, they begged Jesus to uh, let, them, let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down a steep bank into the lake and drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and in the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. Go away because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus said to him, sent him, sent him away saying, go home, tell how much God's done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So Lord, teach us. Teach us about our life, teach us about you and what you want to do in us, and teach us uh, how we might live beyond our fear. Amen. So this is a very strange passage, right? And it gets a little hinky, depending on your upbringing, um, how you want to handle it. C.S. Lewis had a great insight. He said there's, there's two really wrong attitudes. One is that we're totally materialistic and there's no place in our thinking for the spiritual uh, realities. And he said the other one is we obsess about the spiritual realities and we can't balance our life. 
We just get focused on it. And, and I've seen that, you know, among uh, Jesus followers through all the years. You know, some people are just obsessed with the demon possession and every demon, you know, the vacuum cleaner doesn't work. Well, out fell demon of vacuum cleaners. Huh? And, uh, and, uh, and then other people are like, you know, there's no spiritual realities. I'm just taking care of business, you know, and this is the way it is. And we, and we get this kind of contrast. Jesus seems kind of unimpressed by it. Really? Now, if you got off a boat, say, you know, Princess Cruise or something, you get off the boat and, and some crazy guy comes running up and the other, uh, this was recorded in three of the four gospels, so it's not a small story. Um, some of them talk about how he would break his chains and, and cut himself with rocks. So he was big, he was strong, he was crazy. And so if this person comes up to you and you get off the boat, what would you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and his response to Jesus is very strange, you know. Don't torment me. Don't torment me, son of the living God. And that's one you have to think about, because why would Jesus torment me? And then I realized, you know, when, when, when we're in our, our deepest uh, issues, sometimes people who take us seriously can be like tormentors. They ask real questions and they wait for answers and they stay with us and they don't just brush us off. It's easier sometimes to, to deal with things if people take us superficially and just leave us to our craziness in the tombs, you know, running around in the graveyard, screaming and yelling, scaring people. At least we know who we are. Now, okay. Honestly, there's probably one thing that the Christian church, in America anyway, cannot handle. We can handle a lot of things. We can't handle mental illness. We don't know what to do with it. And so we do nothing. We let people run around in the graveyard, basically. Pull away, leave the home, get away, just don't bother us, chain them up, you know, just, we know they're there, they're not going to hurt us because we, we've been around them long enough, but let's just let them go be crazy. Um, it's very hard for people in a church to treat people with mental illness seriously, like Jesus does. Um, I remember when, uh, when it first shared about Damien's uh, severe mental illness um, in California, and I leaned to put a little notice in the bulletin about any moms who have kids in mental hospitals uh, want to meet on Tuesday night and share, thinking maybe somebody would come. And she comes and the room's full, and they all said the same thing. We've never thought we could talk about this in church, ever. This was not something that we talk about in church. I think, what a sad thing that is. The place where we're supposed to be known and loved and open and caring, and we can, we trust God with, with our issues, but not this one. This one's too weird. We can't handle the weirdness. And so, uh, and I wonder, you know, that's probably why I just never dealt with this, because it's just too, too personal for me. And, uh, but the issue for me as I look at this is I go, my goodness, I never noticed that Jesus calms two storms. <laughs> the external one on the sea and the internal one in the mind and heart and spirit of this uh, man, crazy man, right? Both storms get calmed by Jesus. And the re response is the same. Everybody around gets afraid. They're not ready for that. They can handle the problems that they're aware of. They don't know what to do when Jesus steps in and brings a healing because that just changes everything. Now, Jesus asked this guy after he casts out the demons, you know, then, then he asked them a, the, probably the greatest question in the whole Bible and the greatest question in our lives, which is what? What's your name? He asked the guy, what's your name? Who are you? Who do you see yourself as being? And the guy, I was thinking about this, he said, I'm legion. And this was probably a, a hysterical uh, joke, a wordplay for Veterans Day back then. 
because a legion is 6,000 Roman soldiers. And so he said, you want to know who I am? I'm like 6,000 Roman soldiers. I'm crazier than snot. All those soldiers together, that's me. I don't know who I am. And in the Bible, they always are, are the severity of the illness is related to how many demons there are. You know, so somebody say somebody had a demon or they had a couple demons or one demon left the house and seven came back. And they say Mary Magdalene had seven demons, you know, which, you know, quite a bit of problems. And this guy says, I've got 6,000 of them. 6,000. That's what I got. I'm a mess. What are you going to do about it? How do you define yourself? If Jesus says, what's your name? Who are you? Um, I'll write on this. Um, there's a lot of ways we can define ourselves. Um, one is, and this is, I found as a pastor, I see this, you know, all through the years. It's the, it's the same. People will define themselves by their problem or by their illness, or by their sin, right? Illness, uh, okay, got that? <laughs> we'll fix that on the video. <laughs> so, uh, we our problem, you know, so somebody says, you know, uh, who are you? Um, well, I always answer, well, I'm some, I've been depressed all my life. That's who I, that's how I answer usually. I'm, I've been a depressed person all my life. I've been depressed, that's who I am. You wanna know me? I'm, I'm a person who's been depressed my whole life. Some people define themselves as uh, by their addiction. Or, you know, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, that's an identity. Or, uh, or I, I, I'm a drug addict. I, I have that. Or I'm a sexaholic. Or, or I've got these issues. Or um, some people are proud. They're spiritually they defined. I'm a pagan. I don't know anything about God. I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know anything about Jesus. I'm just a pagan. That's who I am. Some people define themselves uh, uh, by, by their job. What's your name? Who are you? Who are you? Well, I'm an engineer. I'm a pastor. That's usually the last thing people would assume. You know, you know, in the restaurant, the, the, the waiter or the waitress can never figure out which one's the pastor. It's always never me, though. <laughs> but, um, you know. On the airplane, when I want to talk to people, I tell them I'm an author, and when I want to be left alone, I tell them I'm a pastor. <laughs> and it works every time. Uh, but, but our job, our, that's our identity, because it's something we know and we do, and we kind of know who we are when we work, and we sometimes work too much because we don't want to go home because we don't know who we are at home. And so we'd rather just work all the time because that's where we're comfortable. We're not so comfortable where things are not defined well, right? Sometimes we define ourselves by our, our successes, you know, or our skills. Uh, I always think the greatest time, I'm a philanthropist. I used to think that meant a stamp collector. <laughs> that's a philatelist, that's different, but, but it sounds the same. You know, so, so I had a choice and I became a philatelist instead of a philanthropist, but you know, uh, it's a joke. You know. So, um, but we, we, if we're successful at something, we've got some renown for something, we have a skill in something, we can say, this is, this is who I am. And we leave out 98% of the rest of our life that sucks. And we just shine out the one thing that we can do. So nobody ever really knows us, right? The whole person. Or we can define ourselves by our relationships. You know, there's, a, there's somebody here today who is a new mom. <laughs> that relationship, right? And, uh, and sitting next to you is a new dad. <laughs> what a coincidence, you know? And uh, the, together you are parents, which now, that changes your identity from who you were like uh, two months ago, right? I mean, not to pick on you, but why not? <laughs> you know? So, uh, but, but we have these relationships. Who am I? I'm their friend. I'm so-and-so's friend. 
And sometimes we try and build ourselves up, if we're particularly insecure, by throwing out names of people that someone might recognize and saying, well, I know them, I know them, you know, and then you kind of, you know, create a reflected glory of being with them. You know. Or at least you can say, I am not like them. I'm not friends with them. I'm not those kind of people. I, it's, I'm different than that. So all of these things come along, our problems, our illnesses, and we can define ourselves in it. And, uh, and, and sometimes people will want to define us in this. They'll say, you know, oh, look at the struggle they're having with their issue, you know, and, uh, and we think we can, we got a handle on them then. We know what to do with them. The town people, this is a crazy guy who lives out in the tombs and cuts himself with rocks. At least we know who he is and we know that we're not him. We're all okay, right? And he's sleeping next to 2,000 pigs. So we don't have to visit on Sunday, you know. But is that who we are? Jesus says, what's your name? Who are you? Who are you? And how do you answer that? How do you respond to Jesus saying, who are you? That's important. Maybe your answer is, I'm a mess. Maybe your answer is, I'm doing pretty good. Maybe your answer is, I don't know who I am. I really don't know. Now the difficulty with mental illness and why it's so difficult in the church is that we want to categorize people and when somebody says, well, you know, I'm you know, bipolar, schizophrenic, I'm on the you know, autism spectrum, I, you know, whatever it is, and, and, uh, or I'm suicidal or I'm whatever, it, it kind of, oh, that's kind of creepy. Hard to be in control when people are like that, right? The answer is yes, it really is difficult. Um, you know, we've spent 20 years walking through the mental illness world, you know, hospitals, locks up treatments, shock treatments, everything we could think of medications, and, and I have determined with complete confidence that psychiatrists are monkeys with darts. You know, and I believe that with my whole heart, and that's why, you know, we look for them all the time, trying to find the new monkey with a new dart. Let's try some crap, you know, and maybe it'll work for a while, maybe, we don't know why, let's try something else. Okay, and uh, the editor said I couldn't put that in the book. By the way, I mean, that was cut out. They're not allowed to say that, um, even if it is true in my limited perspective. But the thing is, how do we treat people the way Jesus treats people? That's really a question for us. How do we respond unimpressed by whatever issues people have? How do we just take it in and go, well, you know, yeah, that's what you're dealing with today. Who are you underneath that? Who are you beside that? And uh, it's interesting that the um, townspeople, when they hear about this, when they hear about the pigs running away and, and drowning, uh, they wouldn't have cared if the, if the crazy guy would have drowned. That would have been okay. Why didn't he go down the hill and drown and we could have, go on with our lives? But no, the pigs drowned. Now we got problems. So the townspeople come out, and what do they find? This is amazing, this passage. What do they find? The man is sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed for the first time, and it says, in his right mind. This is what they find. A person who's having a conversation at the feet of Jesus, uh, under Jesus' authority, finding out who he is in this relationship with Jesus, clothed, no longer running around naked, being crazy, and in his right mind. 
and this scares the stew out of them. This was not what they were expecting. What if Jesus comes to you and heals you of your issues? Your fears, your addictions, your craziness, your hidden things, your secrets, your whatever it is, you know, that you have. What if Jesus comes to you and, uh, and you find yourself sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in your right mind? How would people around you respond? They won't know what to do with you. Trust me, I wouldn't know what to do with you if you people came in here in your right mind. <laughs> At least fortunately you're clothed, so that's good. Okay, we got one out of three, you know, but uh, you know, what would happen if we really found ourselves at the feet of Jesus under Jesus' authority and love and care and, and focused attention, how would that mess up our life? I think this is why so many times we resist surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. It's going to mess things up. Oh. And it's going to be scary. One of the things I'm really grateful for in Harbor Church is that, and I don't know how this happened, but for some reason, this is a place where people who have issues in the mental illness, emotional issues and things like that, have found that it's okay to be here for one reason or another. I don't know why. It wasn't something we went out and said, okay, let's market the church to people with emotional distress and mental illness or something. You know, it's not part of the marketing plan but something about you and your, and your honesty and your realness with each other and your ability to not be superficial and your ability not to be horrified by people's issues have made this a shockingly safe place for many people who would not come to church otherwise. I remember when I... Uh, when I had my shift from being always depressed to where Eileen said, you got to get fixed, you know, and sent me to the psychiatrist and, and I had to go through all the medications and psychotherapy and all this stuff and deal with issues. And, and I um, talked to Damien about it. I said, you know, I'm a senior pastor of a large prominent church and I can't tell them this. I'll let them see it, see the change. And he went, Dad, if you do that, you have betrayed all of us. Because you then have said that it's different for mental illness and emotional illness. You said, you know, if you broke your arm or, or if you uh, found a tumor in your shoulder or something like that, you'd be up preaching about it. But you find you have to take antidepressants now and go through psychotherapy and you hide that? How dare you? And I went, crap. <laughs> I hate it when he's right, you know? And, you know, the church couldn't handle it. It's okay. Um, because they're afraid. But I think when Jesus comes to us, he comes into our lives in a very real way that sometimes is a way that we're not comfortable with hearing about in church because it's not clean and it's not nice and it's messy and, it, and it's filled with questions like, oh, no, golly, whoa, huh, really? And we don't know how to respond to it. And so instead, our testimonies and how we share how God got a hold of us tend to get cleaned up, right? Like pasteurized apple juice, you know, where you boil it to a certain number of degrees and then it's clean. You got everything out of it. Okay, now tell your story. So, I've always wanted to tell this story and I have not had the courage, so I'm going to tell it. Anne Lamott, you know, the writer? She's a wonderful writer and kind of a 
kind of, I think, kind of a crazy lady down in the Bay Area, but she's written some great books. Anyway, so she writes this book, uh, Traveling Mercy, Thoughts on Faith. And I thought, what's a pagan lady like her doing that for? And then she, then she wrote this. April, in the midst of uh, uh, finding out that she was uh, pregnant and uh, with a married man and um, having just gotten an abortion. Uh, the urine test came back from the lab positive. I'd published three books by then, but none of them had sold particularly well, and I didn't have the money or wherewithal to have a baby. Father was someone I just met who was married and no one I wanted a real life or a baby with. So one evening, my friend took me in for an abortion, and I was sadder than I'd been since my father died. And when she brought me home that night, I went upstairs to my loft with a pint of bush mills and some codeine, and I drank until nearly dawn. Then the next night, I did it again. And the next night, although by then the pills were gone. I didn't go out the week of the abortion. I stayed home. I smoked dope. I got drunk. I tried to write a little, went for slow walks. On the seventh night, though, very drunk and just about to take sleeping pills, I discovered that I was bleeding heavily and it didn't stop over the next hour. And I thought I should call a doctor, but I was so disgusted that I'd gotten so drunk one week after an abortion that I just couldn't wake someone up and ask for help. Several hours later, blood stopped flowing. I got in bed shaky and sad and too wild to have another drink or take a sleeping pill. I had a cigarette and turned off the light. After a while, as I lay there, I became aware of someone with me. Hunkered down in the corner, and I just assumed it was my father, whose presence I'd felt over the years when I was frightened and alone. The feeling was so strong that I actually turned on the light for a moment to make sure no one was there, and of course there wasn't. But after a while, in the dark again, I knew beyond any doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I feel my dog lying nearby as I write this. And I was appalled. I thought about my life and my brilliant, hilarious, progressive friends, and I thought about what everyone would think of me if I became a Christian, and it seemed so utterly impossible thing, it simply could not be allowed to happen. And I turned to the wall and I said out loud, I would rather die. I felt him just sitting there on his haunches in the corner of my sleeping loft, watching me with patience and love. And I squinched my eyes shut, but that didn't help because that's not what I was seeing him with. Finally, I fell asleep in the morning he was gone. That experience spooked me badly, but I thought it was just an apparition born of fear and self-loathing and booze and loss of blood. But then everywhere I went, I had the feeling that a little cat was following me, wanting me to reach down and pick it up and wanting me to open the door and let it in. But I knew what would happen. You let a cat in one time and give it a little milk and then it stays forever. <laughs> So I tried to keep one step ahead of it, slamming my houseboat door when I entered or left. About a week later, I went to church. I was so hungover, I couldn't stand up for the songs. And this time, I did stay for the sermon, which I just thought was so ridiculous. But the last song was so deep and raw and pure that I couldn't escape. It was as if the people were singing in between the notes, weeping and joyful at the same time, and I felt like their voices or something was rocking me, holding me like a scared kid, and I, I opened up to that feeling, and it washed over me. I began to cry, and I left before the benediction, and I raced home, and I felt that little cat running along at my heels. And I walked down the dock past dozens of potted flowers under a sky as blue as one of God's own dreams. And I, I opened the door to my houseboat and I stood there a minute and then I hung my head and said, F it, I quit. I took a long deep breath and said out loud, all right, you can come in. So this was my beautiful moment of conversion. <laughs> You can come in. And that changes everything, right? It's not what we've done or what we're doing or what's happened to us or how we're hiding or how we're dealing with our pain or how we're trying to forget something or another. It's not any of that. 
it's you can come in. And we find ourselves at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed and in our right mind. And who cares if it scares the crap out of everybody? Who cares? Well, that's God's word for today. Lord, help us to live in you. Amen.